Hi folks, video today on extreme weather management. Now throughout the course we've been looking at the causes of extreme weather and the impacts of extreme weather. We have also looked at some of the responses, but this video is going to bring all of those responses from all of the case studies together under three broad themes. These themes can be known as modifications, because in some way they modify the risk that is posed to humanity by extreme weather. We're of course talking about risk, so the risk equation, uh, which you'll note from Unit 1, and I have a video on, on my channel, is going to be employed. Risk equals hazard times vulnerability divided by capacity to cope. When we think about modifying uh, the, uh, the extreme weather, modifying the risk to extreme weather, we're thinking about how can we uh, respond to it, how can we manage extreme weather in a way that makes our lives easier. As I mentioned, there are three broad themes. Modifying the event, modifying vulnerability, and modifying loss. Modifying the event is changing uh, the impact that the extreme weather event actually has on people. You can think of it as reducing the hazard, either in terms of frequency or in terms of magnitude. The modifications for the event are things like flood walls, storm shelters, hard and soft engineering. Things like uh, hard engineering, would be the flood walls, soft engineering would be afforestation, growing trees to reduce the speed of water flowing into a catchment, preventing the hydrograph from being too flashy. Again, I have a video on this. The idea is to reduce that hazard right down so that people are protected from it. It's very popular in the most developed countries. It's on show in Frankwell, in Shrewsbury, and the Suds system. These are examples of hard and soft engineering. They're very popular because they, uh, it's obvious how they work and they make people feel safer. But they are long-term approaches. They have to be uh, put in place before the hazard itself comes along in the form of an extreme weather event. We also have modification of vulnerability. This, linked to the risk equation, is reducing the V, the vulnerability. You may not be able to change the size of the event. For example, a heat wave would be very difficult to engineer against, if not impossible. So, you can use technology, warnings, preparation, in order to reduce the vulnerability of the population by educating them and informing them and using technology to keep an eye on what's happening, it means that people are better prepared for when the event comes. Examples would be the island of Cuba. We use a system of radios and the US satellites in order to keep track of storms, such as hurricanes, and then an education program so that people know exactly what to do when a hurricane comes along, reducing the number of deaths. We can also think about hurricanes in the USA. They're very well tracked by the NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association. These are short to midterm. They can be done while the storm is progressing or the flood is uh, in progress, and they can be done in advance to warn us. Can't be too long in advance though, uh, in terms of the technological side of it, but what we can do mid to longer term is map out at-risk areas and educate people. In the very short term though, we can modify the loss. Now this is changing the capacity to cope. This is a way of making sure that people can actually get through the worst when an extreme event occurs. Insurance in more developed countries, aid in all countries, can be used to make sure people have access to money, have their uh, economic livelihoods and possessions protected, and just keeps people um, able to live throughout the most challenging part of an extreme weather event. 
the FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Association, was used um, admittedly a little late in Hurricane Katrina. They coordinated aid coming in. Uh, they also coordinated the evacuation, modification of vulnerability there. However, they were not responsible for Hurricane Katrina's levees and flood walls, which did, of course, burst, leading to the big problems that we saw. We also see, in terms of droughts in Australia, uh, the short-term responses, you could argue a very reactive, knee-jerk response um, from the Prime Minister, uh, Kevin Rudd, at the time of the big dry drought, where he set up water allocations. And the water allocations were there to make sure everyone got access to some water, albeit with problems. It's very useful in the short term. It can't be used uh, beyond perhaps the midterm without it becoming very expensive or very difficult. But in the short term, it's very, very useful. Next question, of course, is what are the positives and negatives of each approach? Now, these are pretty much never done um, on their own. They're always used in some combination. But some positives and some negatives uh, will suit some areas better than others. Modification of the event is very effective if it's done well. Big sea walls to protect from storm surges, flood defences, storm shelters, they do work very well if they are designed correctly. It gives people confidence. People feel that they are protected and that does make a big difference. If people don't feel confident in their defences, then it can mean that there is uh, a difficulty in actually managing any kind of response um, to an event, and it can put a government under a lot of pressure. It's very good in the long term. Hard engineering will last for 10 years, 20 years. Software engineering can last anything from 5 years to indefinitely, if it's in the form of not building on floodplains or having um, absorption areas further upstream. However, it can be very expensive, especially when it comes to hard engineering. It requires a lot of, of uh, capital input, generally by governments. No good if your country can't afford it or if your people won't pay for it. It's not guaranteed to work. Just because a flood wall might keep out a one in a hundred year flood doesn't mean that you then end up with, uh, that you won't end up, sorry, with a much larger flood that will come along and overtop the walls. In uh, the 2011 Tohoku tsunami, which isn't extreme weather, but is a similar principle, the sea walls to protect against tsunamis were overtopped and actually created a massive flood behind them because the water couldn't drain away. This is an unforeseen effect of having this kind of technology. Also, flood defences along rivers can change catchments up and downstream and make flooding worse in other places. Beach replenishment, beach nourishment, afforestation, especially in mangrove uh, areas or on the coast, can also affect coastal areas further along the, uh, the longshore drift route. Modifying vulnerability is very effective if it's done correctly. As we can see in Cuba uh, and in the USA, if you track the storms, people can be prepared uh, and they can be warned in advance. It has no environmental effects, apart from possibly creating the technology, which is kind of a moot point here. It doesn't actually affect the environment. It's purely based on education and technology. It's also very flexible. It's a system that can be tailored and tweaked um, without having to worry too much, whereas of course a hard wall, once it's built, it's built. However, it doesn't actually offer any physical protection. It will protect people um, from the effects, but it won't actually protect the physical environment and it certainly won't protect their possessions any more than basically what they can do with them. Technology can be very expensive, which is difficult for the less developed countries and difficult for local areas as well if they need a particular type of technology. 
This means people often have to rely on um, MDC agencies like the NOAA in the USA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association. It means that, they know that uh, areas won't necessarily have power over their own uh, technology and over their own information. So it is very effective but uh, does require expensive technology and good education programs. Modifying the loss uh, is very much economic focused but it can be vital. In the short term it's what people need. They need food, they need water, they need cash to keep themselves tidied over. It protects livelihoods. If people are insured, for example farms in Australia were insured, uh, if they were insured against droughts, it makes a big difference. It means people don't lose their livelihoods. There are also, again, no environmental effects. If you're paying out money, um, it's not affecting the environment, uh, not directly anyway. You could argue that there are effects if people have insured properties, they don't necessarily think about how they could uh, live in a more um, sustainable way with the extreme weather events. But that, again, is a moot point. Modifying the loss, though, can be very expensive. Normally it's insurance companies that pick up the tab and they can afford it. But if the insurance payout is huge, it can cause those companies to go out of business and it can lead to uh, economic problems within a country. There are also long-term issues. Not just the fact that uh, this is designed to be short-term, but longer term, if aid needs to keep being provided, people become less and less willing to give. Most aid, if it's collected by uh, non-government organisations, is collected within the first three weeks. If it takes three months, six months or years to rebuild, money can dry up very quickly. Also, again, it doesn't actually provide any protection to the, uh, the people. It only protects their assets. In reality, all three of these need to be balanced together according to the needs of the country and the ability to provide and pay quite a difficult balance to strike and it's something that you need to consider when we're weighing up what are the best options for an area and are assessing the responses to extreme weather events. So again, thanks for watching, see you next time.